Alright you guys, welcome back to another video lesson from ICU Advantage. Alright, so in today's lesson we are going to be continuing the discussion talking about traumatic brain injury, and specifically I'm going to be talking about the secondary brain injury. This is going to be an important topic for you to understand to really help you understand the next lesson that I'm going to be talking about where I'm talking about the management of TBI. So make sure and stay tuned, and I am going to break this down nice and easy for you guys. And my name is Eddie Watson, and welcome to ICU Advantage. And my goal here with ICU Advantage is to give you guys the confidence that you need in order to succeed in the ICU by taking these complex critical care subjects and breaking them down and really making them easy to understand. I hope that by the end of this lesson I'm able to do just that, and perhaps if I have, I'll have earned a subscription from you. If you do, make sure you hit that bell and then select all notifications, that way you'll never miss out when I release a new lesson. And one thing I did want to mention that you guys will probably notice down below is, is the channel has actually been approved to offer merch. Check it out when you have the time down below. I've got a bunch of really awesome shirt designs that I think you guys might enjoy, so make sure and check those out down there. And with that said, let's go ahead and dive on in. Alright, so what I want to do here is I want to start off and really explain what a secondary brain injury is. So in order to understand what a secondary brain injury is, we got to make sure that you guys understand what the primary brain injury, which is something that I did talk about in the last two lessons right here. Uh, again, I'm going to link to those right up above here. But essentially, the primary brain injury is going to be damage that is a result of that direct injury to the brain and the vasculature at the time of the impact. And so then what happens with a secondary brain injury is that this is basically when we continue to see additional damage to the brain following that primary injury or TBI. So we can really think of these as resulting from events that are going to be initiated by that primary injury and are a result of either systemic or neurological complications causing a host of intracellular, molecular, and biochemical changes. And generally this process is going to occur over hours or sometimes even days and leads to a worsening of the injury of the brain. And so then what happens is our management of TBI primarily is going to be focused around the prevention or the minimization of these secondary brain injuries. And we can really kind of think of it in this overarching idea of our goal is to have an adequate cerebral perfusion pressure, which is going to be 50 to 70 millimeters of mercury, and oxygenation, avoiding ischemia of the brain, and preventing either the systemic, something that we refer to as extracerebral, and the neurological, something that we refer to as the intracerebral complications. Now, in order to understand how to do that, we need to actually talk about the different contributors to secondary brain injury. So these are going to be some of the things that contribute to, that can really lead to this secondary brain injury that we're talking about. And I'm going to divide them up into three groups of causes. And the first group is going to be talking about the molecular and biochemical mechanisms that can cause this. Now, here for these, I'm not going to go too in-depth because I really think that's beyond the scope of the purpose of this lesson. But some of the stuff and some of the things that are going on is from the primary injury that this is going to cause a massive depolarization. And this is essentially going to halt our aerobic metabolism. And it's really going to deplete the energy stores in our brain. Now, because of this massive depolarization, we're going to see potassium leaving the cell and then sodium, calcium, and water entering into the cell in large amounts, which can lead to damage and edema. Now, we're also going to see the conversion from aerobic metabolism to anaerobic metabolism, which is going to produce lactic acid as a byproduct. Then we're also going to have the release of these excitatory neurotransmitters, which is going to lead to more of an abnormal shift in our normal ion concentration. We also have free oxygen radicals and nitric oxide, both of which are going to be contributing to cell damage. And really, ultimately, there's this cascade of events that's taking place, ultimately that are leading to the death of neuron cells. Now, in addition to that stuff, we're also going to be dealing with a set of causes that are happening within the brain, something that we refer to our neurological or our intracerebral causes. Now, the first of these types of causes, and probably the most significant, is going to be our intracranial hypertension or our elevated ICP or intracranial pressure. And by definition, here what I'm talking about is if we have a sustained elevation of our intracranial pressure, our ICP, that's 20 millimeters of mercury or higher. 
And the reason that this matters is if we think of our intracranial space, it's really composed of three different things. The first is going to be our brain tissue, which makes up about 80% of the space. Then we have our cerebrospinal fluid, which is about 10% of the space. And finally, the last 10% is going to be taken up by blood. And so knowing this, we have something that we call the Monroe-Kelly hypothesis. And essentially what this states is if the volume of one of these compartments were to increase, there also must be a decrease in one or both of the other parts, or you end up with an increase in intracranial pressure. And the reason for this is because the space within the skull is a fixed amount of space. So it just logically makes sense that if you have swelling of the brain tissue, you're going to have to see a decrease in the amount of blood or CSF in order to try and compensate for that. Now, on that note, though, the brain can compensate through various mechanisms and the displacement of CSF, but only so much. And so once the limits of these compensatory mechanisms are reached, then this is when we begin to see the rise in our ICP. And contributors such as intracranial hemorrhage and cerebral edema can all lead to an elevation in our ICP. Any process that's going on that's going to be taking up space in this limited space compartment. And so one of our key takeaways here is that blood flow is going to be dependent on something that we call perfusion pressure. And this is something that we refer to as our cerebral perfusion pressure. And the way we get this is we take our map and subtract our ICP, and that gives us our CPP. And essentially what this is telling us is we have a certain mean arterial pressure. That's our map. Then we also have a certain amount of pressure within our skull, our intracranial pressure, or our ICP. Now, in order for the blood to move inside our skull, it's going to have to fight against the amount of pressure that's inside the, the skull there. And so we take that pressure, our mean arterial pressure, subtract out how much pressure is inside the skull, and this leaves us with how much perfusion pressure we have left in order to perfuse the brain tissue. And again, our normal is typically going to be 50 to 70 for our CPP. So this is a really important concept and you need to understand this because when it comes to managing and ensuring that we're getting enough blood perfusion to the brain, our patient's ICP as well as their blood pressure are both going to be vitally important into figuring out are we even getting enough perfusion to that remaining brain tissue. All right, so the next intracerebral cause that we're going to talk about is going to be seizures. And seizures can be significant because they are going to increase the cerebral metabolic demand and can also increase our patient's ICPs. And then kind of the last group of causes that I'm going to talk about is going to be our cerebral vasospasm, loss of autoregulation, and ultimately ischemia. So now here, again, where I just talked about the cerebral blood flow is going to vary based on changes in our cerebral perfusion. And part of our compensation mechanism is these cerebrovascular vessels are going to either constrict or dilate based on the needs of the blood flow. Now, we also have autoregulation of our cerebral blood flow that's working to maintain this homeostasis really through the use of multiple compensatory mechanisms. And so really with both of these things, what can happen is if we have this vasospasm, this is going to be causing this unnecessary constriction of these blood vessels, which is going to restrict the amount of blood flow that's going to be going into our patient's brain and being available for perfusion. And the same also goes for the loss of the autoregulation. Again, if we aren't able to maintain that normal homeostasis, we can't ensure that our brain is getting the proper perfusion. All of these can ultimately lead to ischemia, which is, as you know, going to be bad for our brain and is ultimately going to lead to more cell death. And so those are the neurological contributors to secondary brain injury. So next I'm going to talk about these different systemic or extracerebral contributors to this secondary brain injury. All right, so hopefully this far in you guys are enjoying this video so far and you guys are getting value from it. If you are, please hit that like button and leave me a comment down below and let me know. So there's actually going to be quite a few different systemic contributors that can ultimately cascade and lead to this secondary brain injury. And the first of these contributors is actually going to be hypotension. And really, we define this having a systolic blood pressure less than 90. So what happens when our patients have hypotension is we're going to see a decrease in that cerebral blood flow. This is ultimately going to lead to ischemia, uh, as well as the buildup of waste products. 
Now, thinking back to the way in which we calculate our cerebral perfusion pressure, if we decrease our blood pressure and essentially decrease our MAP, then this is ultimately going to lead to a decreased cerebral perfusion pressure. So again, we're going to have less of an ability to perfuse that brain tissue. And this can really lead to an increase in mortality in our patients, especially when we start having multiple episodes of hypotension. So it's really important that we're doing what we can to prevent this from happening for our patients. Now the next contributor that I'm going to talk about here is going to be hypoxia. Now our brain is really sensitive to changes in the oxygen supply as it has a high need for oxygen. And so now hypoxia in our patients can ultimately lead to hypoxemia, and this could then result in anaerobic metabolism leading to ischemia, uh, as well as the buildup of lactic acid, which can further cause damage. Now this also can result in cerebral vasodilation, which could potentially increase blood flow to the brain, but on the other hand can also increase our patient's ICP. Now another important contributor is going to be something that I'm going to kind of lump a few things together into an overall term that I'm going to refer to as increased metabolic demand. And so here, things such as hyperthermia, agitation, seizures, which I already previously mentioned, can increase our patient's metabolic demand and can ultimately put this tissue at risk for ischemia. All right, the next thing that I actually want to talk about is a combination of both either hyper or hypocapnia. Now here it's important to know that carbon dioxide is actually a potent vasodilator. And so if we find our patients in the case where they have hypercapnia, so if they have some sort of depressed respiratory drive or if they're on the vent and we just don't have a sufficient tidal volume to meet the needs of their ventilation, then we can end up in the situation where our CO2 can be elevated and because it's a vasodilator, this can increase our cerebral blood flow, but ultimately, like I talked about, can increase those intracranial pressures. Now on the flip side, if we find our patients with hypocapnia, so if we're blowing off too much of CO2, then this is actually going to lead to vasoconstriction and an elevation in our pH. Now this can decrease intracranial pressure, but it also can lead to cerebral ischemia, which again is not going to be good for our patient. So as you can see, consequences on both sides here, whether we're too high or too low, that ultimately are not going to be good for our patient. Now the next contributor that I'm going to talk about again is kind of a split thing here where we're dealing with either hyper or hypoglycemia. And what's happening here is our brain cannot store glucose and it's fully dependent on our body's ability to provide that to it. Now while hypoglycemia isn't common in patients with TBI, this can have an impact though on the cell's ability to function normally. While on the flip side, in the case of hyperglycemia, this is going to be something that's more common and it is associated with adverse effects. Although we're really unsure if it's an indicator of injury or an actual contributor to those changes. All right, the next contributor that I wanna talk about here is gonna be our anemia. Now here we know that our blood is carrying oxygen to our brain, and thus if we have a decrease in the blood available or the hemoglobin that's available, this is gonna mean less oxygen available to the brain, which can lead to ischemia. All right, next let's actually talk about hypoosmolality. And in its most basic form, this is essentially where our blood is going to have too much fluid in relation to some of these other molecules and particles that can exhibit this osmotic pressure. And so what happens is then that this can lead to cerebral edema as this fluid shifts out of the vasculature into the brain and the brain tissue. Now other contributors could also be things like electrolyte disorders. And so here, these imbalances in electrolytes, especially sodium disorders, can lead to either cellular swelling or cellular dehydration. Other causes like coagulopathies can really contribute to intracranial hemorrhage, which again is going to become another one of those space-occupying lesions or growing the size of one that's already present. And then finally, things like acid-base disorders and systemic inflammatory disorders uh, have both been shown to have detrimental effects. And so here you can see a whole host of different systemic processes that can be going on, but hopefully now you can see why these different things happening could ultimately lead to additional damage to the brain. 
These, along with those neurological as well as the molecular and biochemical mechanisms, can all come together adding to different things that we're going to be worried about watching for and trying to prevent in order to prevent the additional injury to our patient's brain. And so like I said, coming up in the next lesson is where I'm actually going to go through and talk about the different strategies and ways in which we manage our patients with TBI. And so with that said, I want to thank you guys so much for watching. I really, truly hope that you guys found this lesson to be informative and useful for you guys. If you did find it useful, please go down below, hit the like button, leave a comment. It really goes a long way to help support this channel. If you haven't already, make sure and subscribe to my channel down below. And if you're looking for more ways to support this channel or really looking for extra content, then consider joining the Patreon page where I post additional content that you're not going to find just here on YouTube. While you're waiting for the next lesson though, make sure and check out another one of these awesome lessons available to you right here. Thank you guys so much for watching. You have a great day.